Brandon Rodriguez Graves was born in Dillon, South Carolina on March 12, 1985, and because of his small stature, standing at 5 feet 4 inches tall and weighing only 150 pounds, he was nicknamed Peanut. When he was three years old, his mother died, and he was adopted by his aunt, Martha German. In 2010, 24-year-old Brandon was living in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and had been dating a girl for about seven years. He was described as a very respectful child who was always friendly and laid back. After high school, he attended Morris College for a year before transferring to Coastal Carolina University, where he worked as a student trainer on the football team. He then graduated in 2008 with a degree in sports management. Unfortunately, two years later, he would strangely disappear. On January 30th, 2010, Brandon and a friend decided at the last moment to travel two hours away to Morris College in Sumter, South Carolina to join his fraternity brothers from Alpha Phi Alpha for the school's homecoming. While on the way, he called his girlfriend and then called his friends when he arrived. After his fraternity won first place at the homecoming step competition, he went to a nightclub called Sebastian's at around 11 p.m. with two friends. Not long after entering, just before midnight, the bouncer asked him to leave after being visibly intoxicated. He wasn't causing any trouble, but the nightclub felt there was a possibility and wanted to nip it in the bud before something did happen. After walking outside, surveillance video caught an upset Brandon being denied entry after trying to get back in. He was then seen in the parking lot talking to a group of people before possibly leaving in a white car and going to another club called the Blue Mist. After that, he was never seen or heard from again. Between 3 and 4 a.m., he tried to call his cousin and a friend, but neither of them answered. He left both of them voicemails, but they weren't able to understand him due to his intoxication. After those two calls, his phone either died or was turned off. Unfortunately, investigators were not able to determine where the calls were placed from. His disappearance is very strange. He had no criminal history, no history of drug abuse, and no known enemies, and the white car he was seen talking to has never been identified. One of the two friends he was with that night took a polygraph and passed, but the other friend refused. That same friend who refused had shown up at Brandon's house earlier that day, unannounced and uninvited, and asked to stay. This resulted in an argument between the two men. After the argument, they traveled together to Morris College in Sumter. Investigators do believe foul play was involved in his disappearance, but that friend has not been named a person of interest. Brandon was last seen wearing black jeans and a blue t-shirt. He had long black hair in dreadlocks and brown eyes. Sadly, as of September 2024, Brandon has not been found, and this case remains unsolved. Eric Grady Smith was born in 1971 and grew up in Virginia. In 2013, 41-year-old Eric was living with his wife, Teresa, and their daughters in Cedar Bluff, Virginia. He worked for Console Energy, where he specialized as a mine superintendent and was the foreman of the Buchanan No. 1 mine. He was described as a very careful individual who always strived to do the right thing. He even studied all the safety regulations and ensured they were followed. Eric also enjoyed hunting and owned a large amount of land that allowed him to hunt any time he wanted to. On November 8, 2013, at around 10 a.m., he left his home and headed out on foot into the woods on his 40 acres of land. Sadly, that was the last time his family would ever see him again. Before leaving, he told his wife he was going hunting on the top of the ridge. While he did that, Teresa took the girls to decorate a tree for her mother. When he left, he was carrying a 50 caliber muzzle-loading weapon with a stainless steel barrel and a stock that was covered in camouflage print. Teresa said he had been off work and sick for the last few days and that the area he was going to was known for its rough terrain with many downed trees and thick bushes. He had likely been suffering from a cold but wasn't going to let that stop him. 
Since there was no cell phone service where he was going, he left his cell phone behind, along with his cigarettes. When he failed to return later that day, Teresa rushed to the local church where Eric's mother, Dreema Smith, was to inform her of the situation. Eric was then reported missing, and members of the church decided to help search. The search effort included a helicopter equipped with infrared technology, law enforcement, and over 100 volunteers who spent the next week searching for him. Unfortunately, nothing was found. If he had a medical issue and couldn't make it home, it's possible that due to the high-tech camo that he was wearing, he's just well hidden on the ground somewhere under the thick underbrush. However, his mother, Dreema, doesn't believe her son would have left without taking his cell phone, especially since his job required him to be on call 24-7. Since Eric allegedly took a muzzle loader with him, explosive detection dogs were brought in to help with the search, but unfortunately, they were still unable to find Eric or his muzzle loader. In 2022, investigators announced they had reason to believe he was murdered, which begs the question, did he really go hunting that day? Eric's friend said that there was no way he was out there because every inch of the woods, including crevices, had been searched. It's also interesting that when bloodhounds were brought out to track his scent, they barely entered the woods before circling back to Eric's home. Some have suggested that he did go hunting and fell into a sinkhole or a cave, which could explain why he and his weapon haven't been found. However, those who don't believe he ever went hunting suspect that his wife, Teresa, had something to do with his disappearance. It's also strange that she was the one calling in sick for him. Plus, while he was out, he never called to check on the mine he was over, which those who knew him say is very much out of the ordinary. An email was then sent on November 6 to the coal company that said he was feeling better and would report to work on Saturday, November 9th, after he went hunting on Friday. So, did he have a medical emergency while out there, or maybe an accident? Could he have been accidentally shot by another hunter, or was it something more sinister? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Eric is 6 feet tall, weighs 210 pounds, and has brown hair and brown eyes. He was wearing camouflage clothing and a titanium Timex watch when he went missing. He is also blind in one eye. Sadly, as of September 2024, he has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Marvel Ann Anderson was born in 1978. In 1994, 16-year-old Marvel was living in St. Ignace, Michigan, and was five months pregnant. She was a sophomore at LaSalle High School and was described as a very popular and outgoing teenager with an unforgettable smile. On May 1, 1994, Marvel went for an ultrasound. The following day, after leaving school, she was seen walking home but sadly never arrived and was never seen again. When she failed to return home, her mother reported her missing. It was initially thought that she had run away due to the pregnancy. They also thought this because of some letters and notes that had been left for her mother by her friends after she disappeared. Regardless, investigators still looked into her disappearance, including multiple interviews with potential suspects. They also performed searches and, at the time, were unable to locate her. Over a year later, on September 3, 1995, hunters found her remains in the Hiawatha National Forest in Mackinac County. In 2008, evidence from the scene was sent to a lab for testing, but the results were not publicly released. Investigators even re-reviewed the case, but were still unable to solve it. One of the main rumors that made its way around town, and could very well be true, is that her boyfriend, who hasn't been named, had something to do with her death. Allegedly, after school that day, she went to his home, they got into an argument, and the boy's father killed her when the argument got out of control. Allegedly, it was well known around town that his father was very unhappy that his son got Marvel pregnant. Plus, according to people from the town, the boyfriend's grandfather worked as a victim rights advocate for the courthouse, and that's why he's never been fully vetted. Again, these are just rumors based on hearsay, and I have no clue if they are true or not. Unfortunately, it's now been over 30 years since her murder, and as of September 2024, this case remains unsolved.
Sandra Lynn Kirby was born on October 20, 1946, and went by Sandy. In 1999, 52-year-old Sandy was living with her husband, Frank Ray Kirby, in Fresno, California. Frank worked for Kerman Unified School District, while Sandy taught first grade at Gibson Elementary School. They also had two grown daughters together. However, their marriage had slowly fallen apart, and she told her mother, Betty Shearman, that she planned to file for divorce. Sadly, she would never get the chance. On July 10th, she went by her daughter Jamie's house for a visit. While there, Frank called and asked her to tell their nine-year-old granddaughter that he would pick her up to go hit some golf balls. After hanging up, she left the home at 11.30 a.m. in her white 1993 Ford Explorer to go do some shopping, but was never seen or heard from again. A little over 12 hours later, Frank called and reported her missing. Four days later, on July 14th, a school co-worker of Sandy's found her Ford Explorer in the Target parking lot at the River Park Shopping Center. Inside were her keys and purse with all its contents. There was also a bag from Marshall's inside. However, there was no sign of foul play or a struggle. It's theorized that whatever happened to Sandy happened after she put her stuff in the vehicle. When Frank was questioned regarding his whereabouts on the day she disappeared, he provided conflicting statements that didn't match the statements given by his daughter, Jamie. He said he had taken a codeine pill, fallen asleep, and had not left home that day, but a call from his cell phone placed him in Reedley, about 30 miles south. He then refused to cooperate any further. Jamie, on the other hand, said she called her father at 2.30 p.m., and he said he was sleeping. He then called her at 5.30 p.m., asking if she had heard from Sandy, and said he was on his cell phone headed to play golf. He never did pick up his nine-year-old granddaughter. At 8.30, he called Jamie again and said Sandy had still not shown up. The two then began driving around looking for her, but were unsuccessful. Frank would later tell their other daughter, Michelle, that he was home all day watching TV and sleeping. Six months later, in January 2000, investigators searched their home and seized a computer, files, and personal records. They also found Sandy's diary, which is how they discovered that Frank was having an affair and she had discovered it. However, the woman had broken off the affair. Regardless, two days after Sandy went missing, Frank proposed to his now ex-mistress, but she said no. The mistress then went to the police and told a different story. She said that leading up to Sandy's disappearance, she had broken things off with Frank because he had become extremely jealous and obsessed with her. She said he was following her and continuously calling her. Then, on July 4th, six days before Sandy went missing, she filed a harassment complaint against Frank. She also said that when he proposed to her, he never told her that his wife was missing. In February of 2000, investigators reclassified her disappearance as a homicide. However, they still couldn't find her and didn't have enough evidence to make an arrest. In 2006, Frank had Sandy declared legally dead against the wishes of her mother. He did this so he could get the title to the house. Sandy was described as 5'5", 140 pounds, with blue eyes and short blonde hair, and was last seen wearing a brown shirt and brown plaid shorts. She also wore a gold Seiko watch with a round face and brown leather band, a gold wedding ring, and a gold necklace adorned with a baby ring. Unfortunately, as of September 2024, she has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Victor Dwight Shoemaker Jr. was born on March 30, 1989, to parents Victor and Nettie, and went by JR. His parents had tried for years to have a baby before finally having him. In 1994, five-year-old J.R. and his family were living in Leesburg, Virginia, where Victor Sr. worked as a maintenance man at an apartment building, and Nettie worked on an assembly line at an electronics plant. J.R. was described as a rambunctious child with a great smile and personality. Unfortunately, tragedy struck while at a family reunion in Kirby, West Virginia. On May 1, 1994, they were staying at JR's grandfather, Oscar Wolford's home for the reunion. They had stayed there many times before, and JR loved to roam around the property, including in the woods. 
that same day, two of his cousins, eight-year-old Lloyd Wolford and nine-year-old Tommy Martin, took a BB gun into the woods behind Oscar's mobile home, which was located near the Short Mountain Wildlife Area. Lloyd lived nearby, while Tommy was in town from Pennsylvania. JR followed the boys into the woods, but allegedly was having trouble keeping up. When they stopped at an abandoned trailer at about 8.30 a.m., JR said he was hungry and wanted to go back to his grandfather's home. So he made his way back alone. When the boys returned to the home, JR was strangely not there. Nettie asked them where he was, but they just looked down at the ground and answered, and I quote, he's up in the woods. She then asked where in the woods, but they told her the wrong locations, allegedly afraid they would get into trouble since they were supposed to keep an eye on him and weren't supposed to play near the abandoned trailer. After pressuring them, they finally told them the correct location, which was about half a mile from Oscar's home. However, JR was not there either. After reporting him missing, investigators gave the cousins, one of the boy's mothers, and JR's father, Victor Sr., polygraph exams, and they all passed. Regardless of the test, Victor Sr. felt that the two boys were acting strange when they came out of the woods, almost like they knew more than they were saying. Unfortunately, it rained for the next five days as law enforcement and volunteers searched the area. Victor Sr. wasn't sure his son was even in the woods and believed that, instead, he had been abducted, mainly because he felt J.R. knew the woods well enough not to get lost. Interestingly, a tracker dog was brought out and picked up J.R.'s scent through a grassy field. However, the dog didn't keep its nose to the ground. Instead, it was in the air. This told police that someone might have carried J.R. from where he was last seen down to the road. For the next five months, the National Guard and Army Reserve spent their weekend training searching for JR on the 8,000 acres of wildlife property. The FBI even got involved, which told others that foul play was suspected. Unfortunately, one of the members of the Appalachian Search and Rescue, Lisa Kern Hannon, was heading home after an all-nighter and tragically fell asleep, left the road, and hit a tree, killing her instantly. It seems that after JR went missing, the family members in Kirby, including the cousins, all but refused to cooperate in the investigation and distanced themselves from Victor Sr. and Nettie. On March 5, 2005, almost 11 years after JR went missing, 19 year old Lloyd, who was eight at the time, died of a drug overdose. Some theorize that JR, wanting to go back to his grandfather's home because he was hungry, is a lie. Instead, they think he knew they weren't supposed to play near the trailers and threatened to rat them out. So the cousins allegedly did something to him either on accident or on purpose. What do y'all think? Let me know in the comments below. Since JR's disappearance, his parents kept his bedroom the same since he went missing, hoping he might return one day. At the time, he weighed 40 pounds and was four feet tall, had blonde hair and blue eyes. He was wearing a red Bugs Bunny t-shirt, red shorts, and white X-Men sneakers when he disappeared. Sadly, as of September 2024, he has never been found, and this case remains unsolved.